It was designed not so that Silk Road or whatever else could happen, but like we've just seen, Vanity Jones a few months ago was finally arrested. And he's now spending the rest of his life in a Thai jail. People who commit crime on Bitcoin 20 years later will go to prison. They will run forever. Ho, 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 happy Christmas, crypto community. And thanks again for tuning in. We have another amazing series direct from the CC Forum and a very interesting guest, someone who's been here from the very early days, Dr. Craig Wright. It's a pleasure to have you today. Thank you so much for coming in. And your socks are very suited for Christmas. Well, yeah. <laughs> Crazy past two days so far, but uh, I really wanted to uh, dive into the past, you know, and uh, there's one principle that comes from a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, mm -hmm. which you must know very well. I've actually read it, yes. Oh, great. A long time ago. A long time ago. It's an old book, but mm. a classic. And there's one that says, first seek to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, and before making snap decisions and judgments and stuff like that. So uh, if it's okay with you, I'd love to go all the way back into the past. Go for it. And see your vision of how this whole thing played out. Is that all right with you? Yeah, certainly. Fantastic. So, um, Craig, if you don't mind telling us in the very, very early days, you know, a lot of people kind of make this movement as we are coming to fight against the financial crisis, maybe beautifying the story a little bit. The white paper itself doesn't really talk about how we're trying to take over the banking industry. Have we're we exaggerated? Not. Oh, okay. That's okay. At all. That, I mean, people neglect that I started building this before the crisis. I didn't respond to the crisis. I started building something. I've made a product to fulfill all the problems and solve them that existed in every other cryptocurrency. eCash, CLP, DigiCash, eGold. All of them had one massive, huge failing. They were anonymous. They didn't have an audit trail. They didn't allow traceability. They didn't allow people to actually follow up and have honest money. There's 15 uses of the word honest in the white paper for a reason. It's not about taking down banks. Bitcoin does not bank the unbanked because that's cash under the bed. Banking is a completely different thing to holding cash. It's great that people will be able to make payments and that will open up a lot to many people around the world, especially with micro payments, small payments and other such things. Payments under a dollar they're the most critical aspect of Bitcoin. Right now, there is no other system that enables you to have fractional sort of under a cent payments at all, anywhere. That's our main thing that we have. Alipay, WeChat Pay, PayPal. Every one of these costs you around 15 cents a transaction. You cannot have a five cent transaction per whatever you're doing with any of these because the cost exceeds what you, you're going to do. So banking, well, banks take short-term money, like investments, uh, like savings, pay, all that stuff, and they put it into long-term developments, things like home loans and whatever else. Bitcoin doesn't create home loans. Bitcoin doesn't create investment and businesses. It doesn't create wealth other than the technology solving problems and adding value. So where people say there's more money, that's a great wealth creation. No, cryptocurrency does not create wealth. Wealth is goods, it's services, it's capital, it's enabling people to work, it's building houses, it's roads, it's fireplaces, <laughs> it's lovely Christmas hats. That's wealth. That's a really good point. And you raised that during the debate just hours ago. So if I just may uh, step back, are we exaggerating this narrative? Was the specific purpose of Bitcoin just to help with microtransactions and then people just try to create their own story out of it? Is that what no, happened? No, not just. Double spend as well. Um, the double spend problem was a big one, yeah. but it's really about leaving that evidence trail. The whole nature of blockchain, this immutable evidence trail, solves so many problems. If we take, take for instance, hackers, the first thing anyone does when they break into a computer system 
is they delete the logs. Imagine now that we have administrator logs immutably stored. You pay a microtransaction and you store your logs. Encrypted, saved, unalterable. No one can ever hack your system again. Imagine you get alerts when someone logs in. Now, there's no way of removing that. The hacker can't delete that alert, turn it off. That's a change. Imagine now that not only like people say, oh, government will do things if they can follow us. Imagine governments are bound by the same system. Corrupt police are bound by the same system. It cuts both ways. When we have an honest, open system, it's not the government can do things to us because the government are also recorded. Imagine every time a policeman or a politician wants to take a bribe, there's a record. Imagine every time that someone wants illegal campaign funds, there's a record. Imagine a bunch of Democrats can't ever lose emails ever again because there's records. That's how blockchain will change things. That's scary to a lot of governments. That's scary to a lot of people. It's not the bad thing people want. It's actually an honest, open system where we hold government, banks, accountants, lawyers, everyone accountable. Oh, interesting. Because the, the story completely changed since that original version, right? Correct. But are you, are you happy or, or really upset about the fact that people are now trying to use blockchain for data purposes and other categories than just you know, money or e-cash. Well, that's why I'm working. The, the whole Bitcoin's only cash actually started in the end of 2010. Eric Voorhees actually had a fight with me uh, on Bitcoin um, talk forums uh, saying basically he knows better. Uh, like I only created the damn thing. Uh, what would I know about my system? Um, and saying you can't do this. Cash has to be pure and all this stuff that well, these core idiots have run with. I mean, this started way back in the day, uh, before I even launched Bitcoin, this whole decentralized bit came about because I was talking with James Donald, um, who's basically been outed as a pedophile um, in the last little bit by a whole lot of journalists because um, he has a whole lot of wacky ideas about children. Um, so, of course, he wants government out because he wants to do his shit. But really, the whole part there is he's sitting there going, um, it centralizes, it gets on um, large data centers. I, I actually said Bitcoin ends in large data centers. And these guys are going, no, we've got to take it into nodes. Sorry, that was never my design. I actually created a system with proof of work that it always ends in data centers. There's no way in proof of work systems you can actually create something that doesn't end in a data center. This ASIC resistance BS, think about it. If I'm running a million machines and I have a few guys running them in a data center with four cent power, I beat you and your home system on 11 cent power uh, where you have to do all the maintenance yourself, where all the outages happen. So there's no way, it doesn't matter about ASICs, the system's designed to professionalize, to scale, to grow. That's the point. That's really interesting. And so you're talking about Eric Voris. Were there people that you would admit helped drive the movement in the beginning? Are there obviously there's a lot of controversy and debating. Mm. Are there a few guys who are there with you in the beginning that you, you think they deserve some credit for the work they put in or? Um, once again, it's double edged. I mean, um, um, I really did like Hal Finney and I did like a number of other people. Uh, but their agenda and what they wanted was completely different to Bitcoin. They never bothered to understand it. And my ignorance was part of the problem. I, I didn't, I mean, I come from a, a, a background before Bitcoin and I launched it. I worked as a financial auditor. I mean, my world was not the same world as these guys. Um, I, I taught um, and lectured part time at the Charles Sturt University and also um, a little bit with the police academy. Uh, and my world was completely the opposite of all these sort of Occupy and whatever type people that came into Bitcoin. I mean, I knew they existed. I've watched news, but it wasn't a world I was used to. Oh, interesting. In terms of the Satoshi vision, so what was that single thing that bothered you the most? Were you like, 
this is effed up. I don't like the direction where we're going. Was there a trigger that made you decide we need to discuss this, we need to debate and we need to? Um, well, I haven't stopped developing. Uh, but what people don't understand is BTC first forked away and then Roger forked away. The legacy Bitcoin is the original one that I have. I said set in stone. Developers don't change the protocol. They don't add op CLTV. They don't get rid of signatures. That's making a new system. It's an airdrop coin. Once you alter the thing and, and sitting there going, Satoshi's not relevant. Too bad. I invented the technology. I'm relevant. You may not like my vision of it and you want to compete. Go for it. I'm not going to stop you. I mean, you might charge you royalties for patents, but um, at the end of the day, competition's good. I like competition. I get up and I write an average of 6,000 words every day. I file uh, two white papers daily with the, um, uh, the, the research team uh, so that we can take those into patents. I uh, review all the code. I do whatever else. Competition is what keeps me going 80 hours every week when I could be spending time with my wife and family, when I could be out there uh, as other people in the room here know who are floating around the Mediterranean or whatever else. I've done that before. I mean, get a couple weeks a year where I get to do that. That's very cool. So it's a choice. I want to work. I want to be challenged. So please challenge me. That's really good. Actually, uh, Roger and Brock Pierce both said the same thing. And what's really interesting is mm. that despite people saying, oh my God, people are going to gang up on Craig Wright. They're going to really try to ca catch him in a corner. But they showed quite open-mindedness to you during the debate. And, and actually, you know, Brock Pierce even said here in the video, he said, if um, Dr. Craig Wright succeeds with BSV, then good for us. If it helps change something in, in, in the community and, and, and with mankind, who cares? As long as it's it not happens. about getting rid of government. There is no world without government. Over 2,000 times we've tried anarchy. Every single time, without exception, has resulted in murder. People don't work without order. We're, we're not naturally all going to agree. We have rules. We have society. And without all of that stuff, if we don't have which side of the road do we drive on, that's naturally not going to be decided by a market. I don't get up in the morning and bid, I want to drive on the left side of the road. Some things don't occur because of markets. It's not a religion. And people make this into a religion. religion yeah. It's about evidence-based knowledge. If something works well and it's efficient, good. If something doesn't work, find a better way. So would you consider yourself, or so you wouldn't consider yourself as a BSV maximalist in that case? Oh, I'm definitely a maximalist. Um, I mean, I own um, both BCH and BTC because they airdropped them to me. Um, I haven't really done anything with them, uh, but I own them. Uh, doesn't mean I, I support them or anything like that. And eventually I'll do something. But um, at the end of the day, I invented a protocol. It works when there's a single protocol. So I'll capture people into that by opening up the, um, the access to intellectual property I'm developing. And alternatively, people can pay licensing fees. And that effectively subsidizes the use on our chain. That and you can scale. I mean, um, right now with the Genesis upgrade, um, where we'll have all the BS that people had tried to put in, wiped out again and back to the original sort of version I wanted. We're going to be in tens of thousands of transactions a second. Uh, following that and the upgrades, we'll be in the millions of transactions a second. And then we'll keep scaling. And even at that point, once we're in millions of transactions a second, I mean, it opens up anything. Anything. Mm. Is that the ultimate division, definition for scalability for you? Is like the million transactions per second and throughput or also the, the micro payments that you were talking about earlier reducing both. The, both. I want to actually see the Bitcoin get down to under a thousandth of a cent. A thousandth of a cent. Mm. Yes. I'll be happy when that, that occurs. So instant, thousand of a cent. Instant, uh, secure, not because we don't need to trust anyone but understanding that part of the model is law, rules. That's why I say enforce the rules. If you're a miner 
You invest literally hundreds of millions of dollars. Only miners are nodes. Section five of the white paper details what a node is. Home users do not discover blocks. They're not a node. Doesn't matter whether you want to be. If you don't invest the money to do this, if you don't have the infrastructure, you're not a node. And that's important because nodes don't secure the network cryptographically, like some people run around the same. Hashes don't secure the network. Economic signaling does. It's a solution to Akerlof's market for lemons. How do you solve a market for lemons? You invest and you signal. The same way that a used car salesman, the shonky guy, is on a lot that might disappear tomorrow. The good guy builds infrastructure, has a big shiny uh, place, spends a lot of money. Why does he spend all that money rather than the empty lot? To show people that if he screws up, you have assets to go after, you have someone who will lose money. That invested capital will disappear. So those miners investing hundreds of millions of dollars now are subject to law. If they're negligent, if they try and cheat, then they can lose that capital. Their investment goes. That's the secret of Bitcoin. It's economically secured. It's economic security. It is not cryptographic security. Mm, very interesting angle. And in terms of actually looking at the proof of work system, that was your original vision. As you know, consensus uh, methods have changed a lot. Uh, proof of stake, people are going to proof of stake. They're different well, proof type of stake of is actually an old system. Uh, mm. People run around saying it's, it's new. It's not new at all. I mean, the nature of having a group sign in that way um, is old as the hills. What people also don't understand is it's easy to compromise. So if you take, say, someone who has 60% uh, of a company, they get to control everything. But they can sell off rights to that 60% with the voting separated. And they can sell off the rights to that 30% and whatever else. And like you have with Rupert Murdoch, who owns around 20% of News Limited, but has absolute control. Because that 20% actually has control power over 60%. And that's what you can do where it's share-based. And proof of work is different because it's not a share-based. There's no anything with proof of work. What people say is, what if there was value? The only way it is going to work is nothing can be earned. It's like a peacock tail. It doesn't mean anything. You invest that money to show, I am willing to burn this amount of effort to show I care about the long-term future of the network. That's what miners are doing. That's very interesting. So do you still accept proof of stake and other consensus systems, or do you really believe proof of work is the way to go? And There is no real consensus mechanism in proof of stake. There's a reason it doesn't work. It's easy to subvert. It goes back to the 90s. I mean, it's a rehash of a whole lot of early concepts that failed. Why? Because they're simple to civil. At the best case, it becomes an oligarchical structure. Those who have power make more power. So imagine a monetary system where the top 60% by ownership get to dictate to the other 40 the first rule they'll say is, we're going to print more money for us. And that 60% then becomes 80%. Mm, that's very interesting. So speaking of which, you just announced early on the stage that by next year, you wanted to prove that even proof of work or Bitcoin's proof of work could be attacked. Well, the proof of work's year? not attacked at all. That's, the, that's where people go wrong. You don't change anything. When a court order happens, you write it onto the ledger. The miners change the output of a UTXO. That's code. Code is not law. Leslie Lessig was wrong. Law wins. It's very simple. You go to those 10 miners, you issue them a court order, and you say, this software change will apply. That's it it then happens. And people can go, ah, we'll fork. Really? To what? 
if you fork, avoiding a legally issued court order, and there are things like worldwide freezing orders um, and proceeds of crime can be enforced globally. So America, I mean, Liberty Reserve, 42 countries, simultaneous takedown. So imagine we've got an order because of proceeds of crime, one of these fentanyl de um, dealers or whatever else. The American government and the Chinese government and European governments work together. And they have these orders put through. Then they approach the miners and they say, number one, you're freezing this. You guys are going to get a plan for the seizure. You put together what the costs are, um, which only upgrade costs. And when the timing is, the money can't be moved. It's a frozen asset, which was part of what you could do with the alert key when I put it in there. Um, and it also, there's a comment that people look at, which is imagine if someone stole your money, um, when the thief steals it, it turns to lead or some gray metal. And then when you get it back, it turns to gold again. You can do that on Bitcoin. That's what I meant. So Bitcoin is ultimately traceable. It is the most legally friendly coin system ever invented. So this idea, um, someone can't just take your money. It has to be an honest decision. A single court can't do it. It has to be something that is bad around the world. It can't just be America or China or whatever else. But when you're talking about things like money laundering, people smuggling, heinous crimes, these things are globally enacted and globally condemned. And when you take something like that, global miners have to act. So imagine if you're that miner with a hundred plus million dollars of, of investment, you now have a choice. You follow that court order or not. And if you're a home user and you're going, I'm going to fork. So what? To what? You can't go to an exchange. If an exchange takes you, they're now a criminal. They will be shut down. They will be seized. If you try and transfer it into fiat, how? If you try and deal with other people, how? You're going to set your own network up with a easy for the NSA to take down algorithm? That's Bitcoin. It was designed not so that Silk Road or whatever else could happen, but like we've just seen, Vanity Jones a few months ago was finally arrested. And he's now spending the rest of his life in a Thai jail. People who commit crime on Bitcoin 20 years later will go to prison. They will run forever. That's a really interesting angle and, and fascinating insights. When it comes to the, the actual attack on the nodes, you're talking about earlier the 10 nodes that have the most control and a little bit about 51% attacks. Is that a legitimate concern that we should have? On Not at that? all. I mean, um, I, I don't see that as a problem at all. You see, people are missing the point. Once there's economic value in the system, it works in law. It's not a lawless system. So if you're a attacker with all that investment, you've got a billion dollars worth of hardware, say. Why would you try and do something that now makes you a criminal? Your billion dollars will be seized like that. That's what secures Bitcoin. It's economic in nature. You do an attack and double spend. And what do you get? Your own transaction back. I've risked my billion dollar infrastructure and I've got a free coffee. Mm. Yay. <laughs> so are you totally against the, the whole privacy thing or, or running actual uh, lightning networks to have privacy because it was built That's to be... anonymity. Mm. Privacy is different to anonymity. Anonymity is not being able to be traced at all. Privacy means our identities, identities are secret. So exactly. if I'm dealing with you, I know who you are. Yeah. So old fashioned policing, not the way the NSA do it now, not the way GCHQ over here do it now because they have to, but imagine the way it used to be where we can trace people and I can go to you and you can dob me in to get a better whatever, that sort of thing. That's the way Bitcoin's designed. Privacy 
If you want to say, no, screw you and uh, go to jail for a long time, you can. If you want to dob me in, you can. Game theoretic, prisoner's dilemma, off you go. Oh, so even privacy, like if people find out, those people may have go and going into jail. So privacy protects people doing things that maybe they don't want others to know about, but illegal. For instance, if I wanted um, to do something that people maybe don't like, I can do that on Bitcoin. If someone wants to hire a hooker and it's legal in the country, you can do it on Bitcoin. And that's easy. That's private. That won't ever be found out unless the wife looks through your accounts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's different. So anonymity is where people say they want to lose records. They want to lose the logs. So um, lightning is really just about that. It's putting all these things off chain, saying no one can find out our drug deal now. Not really understanding one critical aspect of monetary tracing, which is FIFO, first in, first out. Unfortunately, that means you have to keep all the records and the guy who put the money in there is liable. So if you put your money into the, um, the Lightning Network and someone buys drugs, you're also liable. So I remember having someone on the show saying that they really wanted privacy simply because they're like, if you know how privacy sometimes and people know that you have lots of wealth on several wallets and they happen to find out through an exchange that's who you how, are, that's you might get attacked. Wrong, or... <laughs> again, read my white paper. It says every time use a new key, split your change. It has this section on splitting. To make Don't, sure. that you should not have one big key with everything. That's this BS from core with small blocks. You're meant to have lots of little keys. I mean, imagine your billion dollars is in five cent pieces. That's how Bitcoin's meant to work. You're meant to have a big pile of all these keys. To mitigate the risk, to make sure that. Yeah, then no one knows it's yours. They know, ha ha, there's a five cent there and the five cent there and um, so what? Someone breaks one key. Ooh, they stole five cents from me. Very interesting. So I'd love to ask you now that we're talking about the now, we talked a lot about your past and who, what you've con how you've contributed to the system. Uh, when people kind of are hesitant on whether you are Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto or not, what are, what are the best arguments that you like to share in order to get their belief and stuff like that? I don't, the fact it's not a religion. I don't care. I mean, I keep saying this. Um, yes, I created it. Yes. Um, uh, as Tone sort of doesn't get, um, uh, I said, um, there's actually passages in my um, LLM dissertation from the white paper. Actually, my LLM was on internet intermediary liability. I talk about peer-to-peer -peer networks. I talk about um, uh, the whole creation of all these things, how it works for financial services, uh, the problems of things like PayPal, whatever else. And I actually talk about, uh, well, wasn't Bitcoin back then, but <laughs> the nature of what it was. So all that's actually in there. And if you believe that I'm part of a group or whatever else, I don't care. It's not about belief. I don't want you to believe me. I don't want a religion. I mean, one of the things that sickened me most was there was actually a church of Satoshi built. I mean, people started this crap. And look at all the things you get now. People are going, Satoshi must be like Jesus. I mean, for Christ's sake. So you don't really care about uh, if they believe whether you're uh, Satoshi Nakamoto or not, but just making sure that you follow the white paper and you follow the original yeah. vision and make it the way it was supposed to be like. Is exactly. that what you care about the most? Read the white paper. Mm. Really read, read it. the white paper. Don't take what other people tell you it means. When I have that last sentence saying, enforce, look up the meaning of the word. The word enforce is very important. Miners or nodes, as they used to be called, enforce rules. Enforce is what policemen do. Enforce is what regulators do. You don't want policemen making up the rules, do you? That's why we have government. And all these people go, oh, but we want to change the laws. Vote. We're in a democracy. Well, some of us are. Um, 
I'm sorry about the guys in China or North Korea or whatever else, but here in Britain, we vote. If you don't like it, become a politician yourself. Start a new party. I mean, in Britain, people in the raving loony party used to get voted in. So all sorts of wacky ideas can get in and people can actually have a say. But this is the problem. And probably a lot of your millennial audience, get off your ass. If you want to change the world, do something. Don't swipe on your phone. Don't make a pic of the Kardashians with the fucking thing. Go out there and do something. <laughs> That's a, speaking of doing something, I remember during the debate, you actually said Bitcoin is not to be invested in. It's to be used. Is yes. that what you like to encourage most of the millennials out there? Yes. Not just invest? I want to see people using Bitcoin, not hold it and it will go up in value. It's not going to keep going up in value. There's no million dollar Bitcoin. That's Ponzi land. That's a scammer land. There's not enough money globally to have million dollar Bitcoin. Tether isn't going to pump anymore. This is dead. BTC isn't going to 20, to 40, to 50, 100. If you see that, it's going to involve people pumping something with some new tether type thing and they will go to prison. A lot of the tether people are probably going to lose all the backing because they're money laundering. They're not following the law. Bitcoin's not designed for that. Bitcoin is designed to have an audit trail so that every time you make this tether coin, you have to have real assets, real audits, real records. Stable coins are valid if a real bank issues them, if a real central bank issues them, if a real government issues them. And you can trust US dollar issued by the Fed. Why? Because it's just as good as the stupid piece of paper that they give you. <laughs> if it's redeemable for a piece of paper, it's redeemable for a piece of paper. So at the end of the day, if you want Bitcoin to be worth something, use it. Mm, that's a really, I mean, that's a really good point. A lot of people say that it's not just about investing and say, but you're in a developing, you're in a developed country, you don't need Bitcoin. But other people say, no, on the contrary, if you use it, you're helping people who have less financial privilege in, in that sense. So using makes a lot of sense. Than so just, these guys, um, like um, company we invested in, Centbee, um, these, these guys there are rolling this out around Africa. They're, they're down in South Africa. They're, they're putting out um, Zimbabwe or um, sort, of, um, sort of more Central African sort of deposits and everything like that. They've got over a thousand locations now where you can basically buy Bitcoin, uh, which is SB, of course, um, and use it. And it allows them to have people use Bitcoin. People in poverty, people without banking, People can use it for remittance to send money back. And not this wacky idea of once every three months uh, because, well, the fees are too high. That's not real world. Get off your fucking white ass, sorry about the language, and stop telling people in Africa how to bloody live. If some woman in Africa is working across the remittance corridor and wants to send back money daily so she knows what her husband's doing with it and knows that the kids school fees are being paid and knows that their kids shoes are getting um, bought let her and you need low fees for that so that she can send her money when she sees a bill not when the hubby wants to buy a six pack of beer when something's going to be bought for the kids when the rent needs to be paid when the groceries need to be paid each and every time. Real uses, real money, none of this crap about hold it and hope the value will go up. It's really good that you mentioned this because these days on, on YouTube and many like outlets, it's all about when moon, when moon, when one million dollars. So I, I think that message has incredible value and people need to understand that you know you need to use it. That's true contribution to the ecosystem and not just mm -hmm. hoping that it'll go up to one million dollars and become a millionaire, a billionaire, right? Oh, I know it's sickening.
<laughs> and one last question before we we end. Like, so a lot of people say that the original wallets um, that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto you had haven't moved for a long time. What what is the the kind of the idea behind that from from your angle on how the those wallets haven't moved since the the creation you mean of the system? The original keys. The keys. Yeah. Um, sorry. Yes. Because I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> more than that <laughs> i live here in england i've got a nice big house i've got an elevator i've got multiple sports cars i've got a company i've got a great team we're expanding the end the end cool well you definitely had some great insights and i'm very happy the thing that really mattered to me the most through this conference is i realized that despite the difference in terms of ideas principles and values people didn't seem to really hate each other deep inside. It's just- Well, some, apart from pumpkin women. <laughs> <laughs> that, that might've been real hatred. That might've been real hatred, but I'm, I'm glad to see that it's an open debate, open dialogue, and people get access to different views and then make their own decision. What resonates the most with them? And like we can all coexist, uh, hopefully, and, and create a real community that matters more than just us. Isn't the irony here, we don't want censorship. Stop him talking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, people ask me to boy to boycott this this cc yes. forum and i said i would never will because we support not having censorship don't talk to them yeah exactly <laughs> exactly and I, i've been don't you dare listen exactly <laughs> I'm, I'm not no no it's a really it's a really good point i don't think this whole like gossip and you know all that stuff that's going around is really helpful for us so uh thank you so much for sharing your insights you're welcome and hopefully I get to talk to you in the future guys if you enjoyed this don't forget to like comment if you have any questions related to bsv and all the other uh different ecosystem we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible blast that bell notification and don't forget to tune in for our next show at kryptonites thank you so much and have a great christmas holiday